Hi, I'm Randy Christian, and by now you're aware that this week Vantage Point got hit again by COVID. Um, one of the people who was hit was Dustin. And so obviously, instead of him preaching today, uh, you get me, and I've been asked to step in, um, not to continue in the series that he's doing. He's going to be doing that himself, but to do a one-time sermon, um, and what he really asked me to do is to just encourage everybody, something that would help us to remember that even in the face of something like the pandemic continuing to just hit us, um, we belong to the Lord and we can still worship him together. Now, we're doing that this week online. And if you're like me, no, I I don't prefer online. And I don't think online is as good as in person because there's something about being together. But there's also something about not infecting each other. So for this week, we're going to give that up and worship together. Now, remember that worship isn't a matter of where we are. Um, we can worship in our living rooms or uh, our offices or whatever watching this online, but we can also be present during the worship service and not be worshiping, but instead have our mind and heart go somewhere else. So today, regardless of what we're doing in this segment, let's focus our hearts and remember that worship is about us expressing to God how important he is to us. We can start that by praying. And I want to invite you to uh, hopefully again, because we've been doing this, but to pray for those in our body who have been hit by COVID. Uh, I know of Dustin, I know of, of Robbie and one of our elders, Greg, there may be others that have been diagnosed that I haven't heard about. Uh, I know there are others in the body. And so if you know of any of these individually, um, as we pray together, just lift those up before the Lord. Um, and if you don't know of who they are, just pray for the body itself, that we will be physically healthy as well as spiritually so that we can do and be the things that God has created us to do and be. So join me if you would right now as we focus our hearts and minds and communicate with our Father in heaven. Father, we're thankful that we can pray together even in this format using the technology that you've allowed us to have. And we lift these people before you, Lord. We ask that you would strengthen uh, Dustin and Robbie and Greg. And Lord, I don't know the, the names of the others that have been hit by COVID, but we just lift them before you. And we ask that you would physically protect them. We ask that you would heal them. We ask, Lord, that you would restore them fully to strength. But we also ask, Lord, that in the middle of this, that you would strengthen each of them spiritually, that you would use this thing that batters their body to strengthen and, and lift their spirits so that they would grow and be closer to you. We ask that you would be with the body, that you would allow us, Lord, to step into the different things that our leaders normally do and, and in many cases cannot now, that you would remind us to watch out for each other, to be lifting each other before you, but also providing practical help whenever we can. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity and we do pray that you would conquer this disease in Jesus' name. Now, I want to do a, a brief message with you today that calls us back to a specific question. Um, I served for a lot of years in pastoral ministry, and as I was doing that in my last ministry as senior minister of North Orange Christian Church in um, Orange, California, Every, every week I met with my staff and I asked them at the beginning of the staff meeting to answer this question aloud for all of us to hear. What is God doing in your life this week or even right now? Now, when I first asked that question, of course, it, it sort of floored people because 
that's not something we're used to asking each other or in many cases even asking ourselves. But we need to remember, we know God is working in our lives. But it helps us if we know how. So let's just stop and think about this. Why is it important for us to know how God is working in our lives? Right now, as you're thinking about that question, what is God doing in your life today? Why is it important for you to even know that? Let me just share a few thoughts. Number one, we need to know that he is working. We need to know that God didn't just, as the deists think, wind up the world and then let it go and stay uninvolved. The scripture makes it very clear that God is very actively and very intimately involved in the lives of those who belong to him. So yes, he is working in your life and you can be encouraged by that to know that whatever's going on in your life isn't just happening on its own, but God is involved in that. And in fact, let's go to the second. It is important for us to know that God is actually doing some directing. It's not just that he's with us as we bump into life, but that God actually has some control over what happens and what doesn't. Now, that doesn't mean that God makes everything happen. I don't believe that for a second. We have all suffered because of other people's sins. Unfortunately, people have suffered because of my sin. Is God responsible for my sin? I don't think so. But God can either shield us or decide not to shield us from the results of other people's sin. And in my life, I have noticed, obviously I don't know the times that he's shielded us, so I've noticed the times that he's chosen not to. And it helps me to know that when I'm going through hard times, it's not that God has gone to sleep or doesn't care, it's that he has made a decision to allow me to go through that. And that decision is always based in his love for us. It's also encouraging to know that God has a specific goal, that he's doing something very specific, producing something very specific in our lives, not just, again, leaving us to uh, whatever might happen. <clears throat> so let's, let's go to a different question. How do we know? what God is doing in our lives. The first answer is that we go to the scripture and the scripture gives us insight to that. Let me take you to one of my favorite passages. It's Hebrews 12. Now, the letter to the Hebrews is exactly what it sounds like. It's a letter that was written. We don't know who by. Uh, many people speculate, but we don't know. And it was written to primarily Christians who were of a Hebrew descent, Jewish Christians. Now, at the time of the letter, that meant these were people who were being persecuted, uh, but persecuted doubly. They were being persecuted by the Gentiles, by the world, just as every other Christian was and every other Jew was, because our people, Christians, were seen as atheists by the Romans. The Romans actually thought that we were ungodly and atheistic because we didn't believe in all of the gods that were in the Roman pantheon. And we did not worship the gods that they believed supported Rome. And uh, as a result of that, they saw Christians as unpatriotic, as uh, harming the country, and even harming them individually as a result of that. Um, you might wanna think about how that might apply to today in the same way for those of us who don't worship the gods that our country worships. Now, these Hebrew Christians were also persecuted by other Jews because they had chosen to accept that Jesus was the Messiah. And the Jews had decided, in fact, the rabbis had had a, a uh, conclave, if you will, and decided to punish those who would accept Jesus as Messiah. They were to be put out of a the synagogue. They were to be uh, excluded from the life 
of the Jewish community. So this meant that these people who are reading what I'm about to read you were suffering a great deal. They were suffering the persecutions of the Gentiles, but they were also suffering because there was no community other than other Christians uh, that could support them in any way because their own people, the Jews, were also excluding them, and in some cases going further than that in persecution. Now, in the middle of all of this, this letter is written to encourage them to know that their faith is in the best possible person, Jesus the Messiah, and that Jesus the Messiah is better than the law, he's better than the Old Testament sacrifices, he's better than everything that was given to them as Jews up to that point, because in fact, all of those things were given to prepare them to recognize and then to accept the Messiah. So when they did that, they were doing the very best thing. And what they were experiencing wasn't something mysterious. It was something that God was allowing to happen. So I take you to Hebrews 12. Um, it's always a good idea to read the passage before and the passage after whenever a preacher uh, quotes from a specific passage. Obviously, I'm taking this out of context because the only way I could avoid that would be to read the entire letter to you, and you're not going to sit still for that. So instead, I'm going to read just this passage, but I want to encourage you to, uh, when we're done, to just go back and read through this. Hebrews 12, I'm reading from the 7th to the 11th verses, um, and I'm reading out of the NIV, and it says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son isn't disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children and not true sons. The writer is saying, if you're not experiencing this discipline, then that's a sign that God hasn't accepted you as someone who belongs to him. If he, if he recognizes you as his child, then uh, he allows you to be disciplined. In fact, he causes that because that's what fathers do. Moreover, he goes on to say, <clears throat> we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and respected them for it. Well, many of us do. Father, uh, excuse me, how much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? If we're going to respect human fathers for what they do, shouldn't we be really respecting God? as the Father? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good, that we may share in his holiness. That's an important thing to remember. He disciplines us for our own good, so that we may share in his holiness. What's that look like? No discipline seems pleasant at the time. The author's not saying this isn't a big deal. It is a big deal. It's very harmful to them. And the things that we undergo that stress us in our lives are big deals. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, real briefly, let's look at this concept of discipline. Discipline and punishment are often used together almost as the same words in uh, our culture. Uh, that's a shame because they're very different things. Parents, we should never punish our children. Punishment is getting back at the person being punished, paying them back for what they've done. We do not want to punish our children, and we certainly don't want to be punished ourselves because the debt for what we have done is damnation. This is something you'll find, in fact, if you read a few chapters earlier in Hebrews 10, where punishment is actually discussed. And this is a phrase that I've always, when I, when I first came to the Lord, was confused by, because the writer says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God saved my life. How can I be terrified by him? But he wasn't talking about those of us who are his sons. He was talking about those who reject him 
and consistently, as he says in that passage, trample underfoot the blood of Christ by saying, I don't want anything to do with it. So those of us who belong to Jesus, those of us who have accepted him, are the sons of the Father. And he disciplines us, not punishes. The word discipline is the word pedia in this passage. It meant literally to walk around with someone. We get our, our uh, word pedagogue. All of you teachers know what that means. It's the science of education. But we get it because a pedagogue was one who led others walking around. So if we look at how Jesus taught his disciples, he wasn't unique. That's exactly how all rabbis and philosophers taught their disciples. He allowed them to follow him, and he literally walked through their town. He would walk out into the countryside. Sometimes they would travel to other areas. And as he did that, he would not only instruct them, but he would also strategically allow them to bump into some things. He would, he would let them get into situations because he knew that they were going to grow and learn from those situations. So that person was called a pedagogue. Uh, in the wealthiest of families, it was somebody hired. And in the Jewish culture, frequently it would be a rabbi who, whose job it was to walk these people through life, literally, instructing them and bumping them into enough of life that while they might be hurt, they wouldn't be harmed, and they would learn so that by the time they're adults, they're mature. They are who God designed them to be, and they're able to handle life. In this passage, the Hebrew writer says it is God the Father, God himself, who is our pedagogue, who is practicing pedia, discipline, in our lives. This was not something that they just did and then hoped it worked out okay. It was strategic. We can think back even to the beginning of the uh, book of Job, where Satan himself appears before God the Father. And in order to do something to Job, had to get the Father's permission. So here's the thing that we need to take away. Everything that happens to us happens either because God causes it or, I believe, frequently because God simply allows it, but knows that we will grow, we will benefit, we will move towards that holiness that he wants us to have in our lives. And the ultimate result of all of the problems that we go through will be righteousness and peace. Now, let's take this back to that question. What is God doing in your life? What he's doing is walking you, whether you see him or not, through life, allowing you to bump into enough of life that it disciplines you. It hardens you. It strengthens you. It trains you so that the ultimate goal is reached. And that is, in your life, there will be righteousness and peace. Now, if you're sitting there saying, well, I get that, but hey, I've been bumped into a lot of stuff, and I don't see myself being righteous or having that peace yet. Well, number one, is God through with you? I hope not, because the scripture lets us know that God is continuing to uh, produce the result that he starts. He's not done with us. But number two, you might want to ask yourself, how far have you come since God has started training you? Athletes frequently get frustrated because they're not where they want to be, but they forget that they're so far ahead of where they used to be. Their training is working. But if they get frustrated because I'm not there yet, and they stop, if, if we stop seeing what God is doing as discipline and start trying to fight him, we are not going to benefit 
from his work in our lives. It'll cease to be an encouragement and it'll start being something that drags us down. It's not what God wants and it's not what we have to experience. I wanna share one other passage with you. And that is a passage that makes very clear what righteousness and peace looks like in the characteristics of our life. And it does that by, in essence, giving us the personal characteristics that describe Jesus himself. This is in the letter to the Galatian Christians. Galatia was a region in what we would call central Turkey today. And uh, there were people who were experiencing the temptation to go back to trying to earn God's favor instead of accepting salvation by grace through faith. Paul tells these people that, no, the Holy Spirit is working in you. And you, you don't need to go back and try to do these things to earn God's favor. In fact, if you do that, you're going to go backwards. But instead, be aware that the Holy Spirit is already working in you. Now, that just summarized four and a half chapters, um, because now we're picking up Galatians 5, and I'm going to start in 22 and read 23 as well. And this is a passage you've probably heard many times, because we call it the fruit of the Spirit. What is God doing in your life? Well, according to this passage, the Holy Spirit is producing fruit. He lists it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and by the way, it's no accident that that's the first because word order in lists was very important in the Greek language. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What is God doing in your life? He's making you like Jesus. He's literally recreating you inside Whatever you've made yourself, whatever others have contributed to that, when we belong to Jesus, he, the Spirit, is remaking us from the inside out. So how do I know what God is doing in my life right now? Well, I can ask several questions. Number one, is there any training or discipline I'm aware of? The best way I can answer that is, what am I dealing with that's tough right now? Where the very fact that you're listening to me in this context means as a body, we're dealing with some pretty tough stuff. We're, we're being prohibited, at least for this week, from gathering together again, even though we've begun to, to have some momentum in regaining that corporate worship. Individually, we're missing what we gain from that. So yeah, God is allowing that to happen, but God is allowing it. So it doesn't have to be a tragedy. Some of us are going through great sickness. Some of us are going through the agony of watching people we love and, and we're concerned for them because we're seeing what they're going through. Those are just the most obvious things. Each of us has our own private list of those things. Remember, if we're people who belong to Jesus, then the Father is doing this allowing those things to happen intentionally. Because even though we may not see the result, we may not see the spiritual strength, we may not see the specific fruit of the Spirit being produced, whether it's patience, which means long-suffering, or faithfulness, meaning regardless of what we're going through, we're able to keep our eyes on the King and serve Him. Whatever it is that's happening, that's growing, that's being strengthened, we can be assured that this training that we see happening, God is behind it and God is seeing us through it. Number two, we can ask what fruit is being produced. Just, just looking at our lives or talking to somebody who's, who knows us, what's changing in my life? What have you seen grow? Because this makes it clear even though we are commanded in other places in Scripture to do every single one of those things, to love people, to have joy, to be in peace, on and on. This makes it clear that we don't do that on our own. 
that we do that by yielding to the Holy Spirit, allowing him to work through us. And as we see those traits, maybe you find yourself being more kind, which by the way means useful to people, or your faithfulness has strengthened and, and increased, then you can see that God is working in your life by producing those things, and he isn't done yet. That leads me to the third way that we can tell exactly what God is doing, and that is what's missing. In other words, we look at this fruit of the Spirit. What part of that isn't yet really present in my life? What about that righteousness and peace? Is it there? Am I experiencing that? Am I holy? Is my life holy? It's one thing to be proclaimed holy by God, and that's very real. But God isn't just saying we're holy. God is changing us, purifying us to make us holy in our lives. So I can look at my own life and say, yeah, that's, that's an area that's it's not right where it should be now. Well, I know then that that's an area God is targeting and strengthening. Remember, this is our Father, the one who has perfect love, the one who is motivated in everything he says, everything he does, and every command he gives us by love for us. So as we're going through some hard times right now, individually and as a body, I want to encourage you. Don't see those as things that the evil one is throwing at us and somehow we've got to hold on. See him as an athlete training. And if it's getting harder, then that's good news. The, the coach doesn't give the hardest workouts to the weakest players. He gives the hardest workouts to the players who can handle those workouts. So as these things become more difficult, it's a sure sign God is working in your life and God has been strengthening you and you are growing. So today, I want to encourage you. Look at what God is doing in your life. Encourage others who are down, who are maybe feeling physically, emotionally, spiritually uh, embattled by the stuff happening in our lives to see that God is active and working in their lives. And God only does that because he loves you.